A circadian rhythm is some process that happens in the body that changes over a 24-hour cycle or over a single day. Now even though it might feel as though much of your body and how you act and how you behave and what you're made out of stays relatively constant, there are many aspects of physiology and behavior that increase and decrease across the day and night. Some examples of these include blood pressure, body temperature, hormone levels, cognitive abilities, and sleepiness and alertness. You may notice that you're tired at certain times in the day more than you are at other times. These daily changes are called circadian rhythms and can be seen in a wide variety of animal species and some organisms that don't even have neural systems like plants, fungi, and bacteria. Circadian rhythms have two important properties. They self-regulate and they're entrainable. Now, what does that actually mean? Uh, well, circadian rhythms will self-propagate if left alone, on their own, all things being equal. You don't have to do anything to them. They'll increase and they'll decrease roughly over a 24-hour cycle all by themselves. If you were locked away in some kind of isolation tank where there was no light, no sound, no people, and absolutely nothing happened ever, you never slept, you never ate, nothing. You were a kind of, uh, of organism in the void you know, locked away in a coffin. These rhythms would still exist. Your body temperature would still go up and down in a rhythmic way every 24 hours, as would your blood pressure, testosterone levels, and a number of other biological processes. Uh, and in fact, some of the very first scientific studies examining this effect were done with people in caves or in bunkers, where they were isolated from the rest of the outside world. But one of the most important things about circadian rhythms is not that they affect things like, you know, how well some protein gets metabolized over the course of the day, but their influence on behavior. And uh, as we'll discuss later in the video, this can be anything from cognition to learning ability and emotions. Although circadian rhythms will move up and down and fluctuate all on their own, the second very important property of them is their ability to be triggered, or what's usually called entrained, by an external stimulus. And the most common and most powerful of these stimuli is the sun. Uh, blood pressure and temperature and hormone levels, you know, they might fluctuate up and down throughout the day, but how they change and when they change is largely dependent, believe it or not, on the time of day that the sunlight first hits your eyes. So, how might an organism actually go about regulating itself in this 24-hour fashion? Uh, well, one way it can do this is through what we'll call an auto-regulatory loop of transcriptional activators, uh, which is a mouthful, so let's actually go over what that means. Inside the DNA of cells, there will be certain genes that will be activated by cellular activity, and they will be transcribed and translated into proteins. You know, pretty, pretty standard biology 101 stuff. But these proteins will then go on and activate other genes, which will then be transcribed and translated into other proteins, and then those proteins will go and activate other genes, kind of, you know, one after the other after the other. Like if you come up to me and you whisper in my ear, you know, hey, go tell that guy to go tell that guy to go tell that guy something. Activation of one leads to activation of the other, which leads to activation of the other. So how might this actually create a kind of auto-regulatory loop of genetic function? Uh, well, when the first set of genes creates proteins, those proteins activate the second set of genes. But the proteins created from the second set of genes will shut off the initial set of genes that activated them. And so what happens is that the proteins from over here activate the genes over here, and the proteins from here shut off these genes. And when these genes get shut off, the proteins created from here will also decrease over time. With less of these initial proteins around, uh, the second set of genes will become deactivated, they'll stop producing the inhibitory proteins. And when the inhibitory proteins go down, that means the original set will now no longer be inhibited and can fire up again and produce more of its proteins, which activate the second set, which inhibits the first set, which activates the second set, and so on, and so on, and so on. So basically, A leads to B, B stops A. If there's no A, then B stops as well. And with no B, A can start up again, which leads to more B and so on and so on forever and ever and ever until we die. Now, the first set of genes are referred to as activators, while the second set are referred to as repressors. And in the circadian system, these genes are referred to as clock genes. The activators are called clock and BMOL1, and the repressors are called PER1, 
through 3, and cry 1 through 2. Uh, which isn't particularly important, it's, you know, it's just what they're called. Now, if all these genes did was just, you know, turn each other on and off over and over again, it wouldn't be very interesting. Now, the interesting thing about these loops is that they don't exist in isolation, and that when clock genes are activated, not only will they activate the repressors, but they will also activate a wide variety of other genes as well. Genes that are responsible for things like temperature and glucose metabolism in other tissues. So if temperature regulation genes are dependent on clock genes, and clock genes fluctuate in a rhythm, well, then temperature will also fluctuate in a rhythm. And this is an example of how physiological processes dependent on protein expression in cells can be expressed as circadian rhythms. So how might the timing of this loop be activated in the first place? Well, to answer this question, we're going to have to cover a bit of neuroanatomy. The circadian system in the brain is made up of a hierarchy of oscillators. And oscillators are these brain regions whose activity fluctuates in a roughly 24-hour cycle like we've just been talking about. And at the top of this hierarchy of oscillators is a brain region called the suprachiasmatic nucleus of the hypothalamus, which no one wants to say, so we just call it the SCN. The SCN is often referred to as the master pacemaker because through all of its connections to peripheral oscillators and peripheral pacemakers, it can control all of the rhythms in the body. Uh, two examples of these peripheral organs might be the intergeniculate leaflet and the pineal gland. Now let's say your SCN was lesioned surgically or it was damaged somehow or something bad happened to it. You would still be able to do all of the things that you do, uh, behaviors or, or you know, physiology of your body that you normally do in a rhythmic fashion. Like, you know, you'd still have a body temperature, you'd still be able to eat and sleep and drink water and all that stuff. But it just wouldn't happen in a rhythmic fashion. It would be very scattered and random and uncontrollable and, and all over the place. Uh, now, as you can imagine, the SCN is uh, in, entrained or set in motion by the rising and the setting of the sun. This light triggered signal activates neurons in the SCN, which activates clock genes and triggers the start of the 24-hour cycle for that day, and in turn, the SCN sends signals to a wide variety of other brain areas. So it works something like this. When the first light of day hits the retina in your eye, it will activate photoreceptors like rods and cones for the perception of light and colors, and this information will be sent to the thalamus and to the neocortex and constitutes what we call standard vision. But there are other light-sensitive cells in the retina, and these are called retinohypothalamic ganglion cells. And you know, the easiest way to understand this is that the signal goes directly from the retina to the hypothalamus, which is where the SCN is located, uh, hence the term retinohypothalamic, from retina to hypothalamus. And the type of cell is just called a ganglion cell, and it projects um, into the brain from the front of the retina. So what about sleeping and waking? Well, the SCN regulates glucocorticoid release from the adrenal glands during the day, as well as melatonin release from the pineal gland during the night. And uh, the adrenal gland and the pineal gland are two important organs related to hormone function, but we'll talk about that a little bit later. So for now, melatonin is a molecule uh, released by the pineal gland that will activate the parasympathetic nervous system. And this is a large set of neurons related to uh, rest and a reduction in activity whereas glucocorticoids released by the adrenal gland will uh, mobilize glucose for cellular consumption, for you know, uh, high cellular activity, as well as activate the sympathetic nervous system, sometimes referred to as the fight or flight nervous system, um, for you know, high levels of activity and alertness and awakeness. And the fluctuating of these two processes, pineal uh, melatonin release at night and adrenal glucocorticoid release during the day are two very important processes that regulate the sleeping and waking cycle. Not only do the very basic biological processes fluctuate over a 24-hour cycle, you know, things like temperature and metabolism and sleeping um, and, you know, the regulation of proteins, but very complex behaviors can fluctuate in a circadian fashion as well. Things like emotion and memory and cognition. One area in which circadian rhythms can influence behaviors is in cognition. And we can loosely define cognition as the mental action or process of acquiring knowledge and understanding through thought, experience, and the senses. And these are some examples of cognitive behaviors that have been shown to change in a circadian way. 
attentional capabilities, ranging from sustained attention, which would be your ability to focus on one thing for a long period of time, like listening to a conversation, uh, selective attention, which would be focusing on one thing while actively avoiding others, um, or divided attention, which would be focusing on several different things at once. Inhibition, which in this context we'll define as the ability to purposefully avoid certain information from entering one's awareness, or the ability to purposely prevent oneself from doing certain behaviors. And a classic example of inhibition is something like seeing a piece of cake, but choosing not to eat it even though you want to. And finally, uh, language abilities. So, why might all of this be important? Well, um, there's so many different things in your daily life that depend on cognitive behaviors. And if your cognition and your cognitive behaviors are dependent on circadian rhythms and they change over the course of the day, then things like, uh, like how productive you are at work or maybe even how well you perform on a test can be influenced by the time of day that you do those things. The SCN activates the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, or the HPA axis for short. You can think of the HPA axis as being the primary hormone control system of your brain and body. Everything that deals with hormones will start with the HPA. And as the name implies, the key organs involved are the hypothalamus, the pituitary gland, and the adrenal gland, like we talked about earlier. The hypothalamus sends signals to the pituitary, which in turn sends signals to the adrenal, which in turn releases hormones into the bloodstream. Among other effects, these hormones ultimately will make it back to the brain because hormones travel through the blood, and there are lots of blood vessels throughout the brain. And these hormones can influence all sorts of things, from stress and mood and sexual arousal. In fact, uh, a lot of problems with the HPA axis are implicated in several mood disorders, like depression, anxiety, and PTSD. So one can only imagine that if you know circadian rhythms affect the HPA axis, and HPA axis activity can affect all of the things we just mentioned, then these behaviors will fluctuate as a circadian rhythm. And that, what we'll talk about next, something called circadian disruption, which is when your rhythms do not function properly, um, this can have a negative effect on your, uh, your mood and your stress. One behavioral phenomenon that has been extensively studied over the past few decades is the effect of circadian disruption on cognitive performance and on memory. Now, circadian disruption is when you take that 24-hour cycle that gets uh, set in motion by the first sunlight of the day, like we've just been talking about, and you interrupt it somehow. And this can happen in a whole bunch of different ways. Let's say you, uh, you get up in the middle of the night and you turn on the bathroom light. Well, that's light that hits your retina, you know, hours and hours before it's supposed to. Um, another way is through shift work. Let's say you work 9 to 5 and you work a 9 to 5 job for years, and then all of a sudden you change it up and now you're working 10 p.m. to 5 a.m. Well, now the times of day that light hits your retina and when you sleep and when you wake is completely changed and that can completely disrupt all of the processes that we've just been talking about. And just like how sleep deprivation can cause a whole number of cognitive problems, you know, like delayed reaction times, uh, making it unsafe to drive, attentional problems, lapses in memory, circadian disruption can have the exact same effect. Now, why is circadian disruption important? Well, there are lots of people who do shift work or lots of people who do work where they get up and they go to bed at varying times throughout the day. And this can be very detrimental, not only to their, to their mental health, to their physical health, but it can be a huge drain on the rest of society. So when you take, you know, doctors and they work these incredibly long, like 36 hour shifts and they do all this extra work and they're sleep deprived and they're circadian disrupted, well, when you, when you do that to doctors, they make more medical errors. They make more uh, misjudgments in diagnoses. When you do this to laborers, there's more work accidents. Um, and it's, it's not a good thing for society, for large groups of people, to be waking up and going to bed at variable times across their lifespans. And maybe even on a more or more wider scope, uh, the retinohypothalamic tract, like we talked about at the start of the video, is very sensitive to light changes. And one thing that people do nowadays is they use uh, digital mobile devices. They've got laptops, they've got tablets, they've got iPhones, and some people will use these things way, way into the middle of the night. And they stare at TV screens, and that's not good because now it means huge portions of the population can be messing with their circadian rhythms all the time. So, in conclusion, 
in order to maintain good mental health, good cognitive performance and, and memory, uh, and good hormonal balance, it's very important to wake up and go to bed at the same time every day. So get some sleep and thank you for watching.